I wanted to start my talk with looking at the differences and the similarities between quality management systems and safety management systems. You have all, I guess, been familiar with quality assurance, quality management systems for some decade or so now. And uh, it's a very, you know, it's a pressing question for people who are running a business. To what extent does this relate to safety management? Is it part of quality and so on? I think the, these, are the, these are the issues I want to begin with. So if we start by asking the question, what do they have in common? Well, I think it's reasonable to say that in regard to the principles and the basic underlying philosophy, then they have about 70% quality and safety management systems in common. So they all assume that it has to be planned and managed. It doesn't happen by accident. They assume they actually depend crucially upon measurement and monitoring. Both involve every aspect, the whole enchilada, uh, every function, every process, every person. And both strive for continuous improvement. They're not looking for massive, dramatic step changes in either safety or quality. They're looking at this Kaizen, where you iterate, massaging towards uh, a, a, a more uh, a safer or more higher quality state. But there are important differences, and these are the ones I, I want to dwell upon here. And so one of the things that safety management has to bring to the table, which is different from quality management, is the fact that it has to focus upon the human and the organizational factor, because they dominate the risks now in all kinds of ways. There is another question which says, well, can we apply quality assurance to the business of safety management? Will quality assurance assure safety? Well, the answer emphatically is no. And, uh, Clearly, one can apply it to the documentation, to the paper trail of safety management systems, but in themselves, they do not assure, in itself, it does not assure safety. Just let me remind you briefly of the quality assurance principles. It's clearly about assuring customers and other people that your system can deliver what it claims to deliver, the products and the services, to the required quality. And the way it goes about this is to document the way in which things are supposed to be done and then audit to check whether the actuality is matching what is intended or what is desired. And where there are discrepancies, these are fed back into the organization so that they can take some corrective action and as a consequence, they can continuously improve their, import, their performance. Well, that's the theory. But I think as we know now that quality assurance is such a labor-intensive business that it's become a question very much of form rather than substance, ticking the boxes, working very, very hard. Uh, I mean, to put together an audit team, for example, takes an enormous amount of time and effort to brief them, to come up with a checklist and all the rest of it. It's a, and just going through the motions of that business of quality assurance often blinds people to the fact that what they are assuring is not actually the reality. And this is very clearly the case in two, there are several quality assured accidents. I'll start with one, which is a UK accident, a maintenance accident, uh, where in this case, the Britannia 320 took off with the spoilers left in the maintenance mode rather than in the active mode. The aircraft took off at Gatwick and uh, very, very, with great difficulty, managed to get back on, onto the ground, very difficult to maneuver. B British Airways, who were, who were actually uh, doing the maintenance at that point, had turned uh, in the early 90s ha and late 80s, had shifted from quality, to control, qu quality control to quality assurance. That is, they had taken out the independent inspection function and left it in the hands of the maintainers. And in this accident and in several other accidents, what they signed off for was not actually done. And, you know, there is. I, I have said at one point that uh, maintenance can seriously damage your aircraft, and uh, th this, this is certainly the case. I, I mean, the whole my interest in, in aviation maintenance began with the BAC 111 event uh, back in 1990. You may recall that this aircraft uh, took off from Birmingham and out popped at 17,000 feet the uh, window that on the cap on the captain's side. The captain went halfway out of the window and fortunately it was held onto by a burly 
flight attendant uh, while he flapped on the roof, and uh, he actually got away with just a broken thumb and, and uh, some, uh, some, some, some problems with, with the temperature. But uh, he, the man who did this, and this is one of the essence, I think, of, uh, in a way, of, of the error management, uh, safety management problem. The man who did this, who had a 30-year blameless record, he was the shift maintenance manager. He uh, had, as ever, an, a short-handed shift. Uh, it was summertime, people were on vacation, people were sick, and so he decided to do this window change himself, and in the process, he put in bolts which were smaller in diameter than those necessary. He didn't detect this when he was talking them in for all kinds of all the usual reasons. Uh, first of all, he didn't have the right work stand, so he was leaning across the nose of this aircraft. His torque, uh, his torque screwdriver didn't have a proper magnetic bit, so he had to hold that in while he was doing it. So he didn't actually detect the fact that, and it was an elliptical nut, so the feedback was enough to deceive him. And there was a whole chain of accidents. But the point is, again, he signed off uh, that this was done legitimately. And again, there are several of these accidents. I did once go to Air France, and well, I was quite obsessed by maintenance, and uh, maintenance is a hazard. Um, I told the Air France directors that, uh, in my opinion, that the only reason you had pilots in an Airbus was uh, to recover maintenance failures. And uh, <laughs> they, uh, they, they, they said at the end, just to show the French do have a sense of humor, at the end, the director of maintenance got up and said, uh, I, I would like to reassure my pilot colleagues that they don't have to worry about their jobs. We'll keep the errors coming. Don't you worry about it. <laughs> Closer to home, uh, I've, got both, I've got most of the numbers, all the numbers wrong here. It's 1994, and it's 11 men, not 13 men. But either way, uh, it's very close to home. And here was an organization that had just been accredited, AS3902. It had got a falling, it had a falling lost time injury rate. All the obvious indices suggested that it was a resilient system. It manifestly wasn't. So what was the problem? Well, in both cases, quality assurance failed to consider whether the business that they were, or the system, the process they were auditing was a good process, a good system. And it failed to verify when people signed off that actually that represented the truth. In neither case has, was that so. So what are the lessons we can learn from these quality assured accidents? And I think they have important implications for safety management. The first lesson is that clearly uh, there is much more to auditing than simply checking the paper trail. There has to be an appropriate system to audit. It's no good relying on the paper trail unless it actually reflects reality. And then there's the question of what do smart auditors do? There's such a lot of work to do in an audit that just chicky ticking the boxes is, you know, is, is a pretty laborious business. But the really smart auditor should be asking, what is it that this audit process I'm currently conducting would not be able to reveal that would threaten both quality and safety? And this is the issue, I think, about safety management. How safety management is manifestly different in the sense that the underlying feature of safety management, almost the driving force, is this need for waking up every day and thinking it's going to be a bad day. It's something about chronic unease, eternal vigilance. It's thinking about the ways in which Sod, Murphy, uh, and this is not a firm of solicitors, by the way. I, th throughout this week, people have imagined that sometimes it was and the malign puries could, could actually screw you up. You know, the undocumented sneak parts. It requires an effort which goes beyond any kind of formality. It's actually, you have to think to the substance of the business. So what's safety management? Well, essentially, it means identifying and controlling your hazards in a systematic, documented fashion. And also, you have to devise the plans for the control and the recovery in this way. But whatever you do, I think one has to recognize that it's going to be driven by two principles. The obvious ALARP principle, that is keep your risks as low as reasonably practicable, which is, of course, in a way, uh, the obvious thing. But more almost the thing that doesn't get remembered, at least by the, the, the people who push safety management systems, is the second principle, ACID, and still stay in business. In other words, whatever you do has got to be in the context of production. Production pays for protection. Protection can destroy failures of protection, can destroy production, but it doesn't pay. So, 
And there's also the issue, of course, that the people who are managing the safety management systems are essentially there for their productive skills rather than their safety skills. You know in your business very well, and airmanship is very much a part of feeding that knowledge into the ab initio pilot at the beginning about the physical ha hazards of aviation, gravity, terrain, weather, inflammable substances, and so on. But most of you come, I guess, from an operational or a technical background and maybe are not so familiar or not so comfortable with what actually does dominate the risks now that the materials, the components have radically improved in their reliability over the past 25 years or 30 years, but we are still the Mark I human being, and uh, that, therefore it seems we've become massively more, if you like, error prone, but that isn't the case. The human and organizational factors actually become the residual category of causality, and there's no way one can attempt to manage uh, safety in a complex system without regard to those two factors. So that's what I want to focus on. Just to remind you that there are two ways of looking at the error problem. There's the person model, which is the dominant model. It's the one that everybody, almost everybody, in some way still subscribes to, even though they might uh, say otherwise. And that's the view that in a bad event, in an accident, the initiating the causes occur between the ears of some individual at the sharp end, and this is generally the case often when you're dealing with personal injury, when you're dealing with uh, people in direct contact with hazards and so on. But it certainly is not applicable when you're dealing with complex systems. The problem with this is that the, rem the remedial efforts are all time directed at those things, to trying to change the minds of the people at the sharp end. So they blame, they train, they, re they, uh, they shame, and, and they write new procedures and they try to motivate, and they use fear appeals and sticks and carrots and so on. Now, that does have an impact, but if you take, for example, the notion of fear appeals, which you see at Christmas time, obviously, here, I guess, here, as we do, you know, terrible pictures on the television ads of children going through windscreens and so on. And, and these, you know, they shock and they, they make you think. But, of course, the tr problem with fear appeals, they don't actually change the behavior of the young males to whom they are directed because it'll never happen to them. I mean, that sort of thing doesn't. I can hold my drink. I can, you know, it doesn't happen. So we have to go beyond the person approach and look be and assume that actually that error per se and even violations per se are actually rather boring. You know, they are no more surprising uh, they are as much a part of life as breathing or dying. Uh, they are in themselves not interesting. What is interesting are the circumstances that create these deviant or unwanted actions, unsafe actions. And we have a much better chance of controlling, if you like, the system than we have of getting at these fleeting ephemeral things like inattention, like forgetfulness and so on, to which we are all to which we're all prone. So you know, we can't remove fallibility from the human condition, but we can change the conditions under which people work. And that is, seems to be the key to a safety management system. I, I, I you know, I've got myself identified with these slices of Emmental, and, uh, and I realized, you know, they said of Freud that he knew he was famous when he uh, got onto a boat to America in 1909 and saw his cabin student, steward reading uh, The Psychopathology of Everyday Life. And I had a similar experience, although I wouldn't put myself anywhere in the same class, that I went to Vancouver and went to the tower and a young controller uh, said, oh, Jim Reason, you're the Swiss cheese man. So, <laughs> so I am the Swiss cheese man. And, uh, but I want to point out, I want to spend a little time pointing out what I think now are the weaknesses of this view. There, has, there are limitations. Uh, they're not, I believe, fatal limitations, but they are limitations. So the first thing about it is that Emmental, Swiss cheese, is not, uh, is not a dynamic thing, uh, but the world is actually changing. So that whereas the holes in the cheese don't open and shut and move around, the, the holes in the defenses, which are what these cheese slices are supposed to represent, actually do. And in fact, slices of cheese get pulled out, they get pushed back. There's an enormous, enormous amount of dynamism going on, which is not caught by this picture. Of course, 
the, the cheese interposes between whatever the hazards are, which we recognize, and the key thing about, of course, about safety management systems is that you apply a you apply a lot of intelligence to trying to identify what the hazards are. They're not always obvious. The holes can open up for all kinds of reasons. There's the obvious reason is that people screw up. People make errors or violations at the sharp end. And that causes a kind of brief window of opportunity. But it's not very lasting, not very long. The more enduring holes are the ones that are due to latent conditions, to the things that exist within the system and, and have existed often for many, many years prior to an event which arise because the designers, the builders, the managers, the procedure writers cannot foresee all the scenarios of failure. Inevitably, therefore, there will be gaps left in the defenses unwittingly. Sometimes these might be in error, but most often they are not. And this is why I want to draw your attention to a change of term. And that is, I used to call these latent errors, latent failures. The implication being that somebody had screwed up, not at the sharp end so much, but back in the design office or in the boardroom or wherever. I now think that that, would, that is entirely inappropriate. Yes, people do make mistakes in the boardroom, uh, there's no question, and they do have terrible consequences. But the things that create latent conditions do not have to be in themselves errors or mistakes. And I use the word condition because in the philosophy of causality, a condition is something that's necessary for an event to happen, but is not a direct cause. Like oxygen is necessary for fire, but it is not the cause of fire. It has to be some source of ignition. So, you know, if you're, a, if you're a big boss and you're a senior manager, you allocate resources among departments, and you can't always do that equitably, and often it's not commercially sound to do it equitably. But those people who end up with a thin slice of the case cake then translate that inevitably into workplace conditions that are error provoking. There's undermanning, there are inadequate tools and equipment, there's time pressure, all those things that ultimately shape, uh, that ultimately shape the, the holes that create these uh, accidents. So I, I just wanted to make that point about conditions rather than errors. There are dangers, there are defenses which we interpose to prevent those damages, de de prevent those dangers turning into damage losses and so on. So we look at each of these defenses and ask ourselves, how did they fail? Where did they fail? When did they fail? Now, if there is leisure, then you can go beyond that, uh, as accident investigators do, and ask the question in relation to each failed protection. And so the world starts to think not about the unsafe acts, but what about the provoking conditions? What were the local workplace factors and what behind those, if one, could, if one can clearly identify them, were the organizational decisions and conditions that created those. And the question always is not who, who screwed up, but how can we uh, make some global reform as a consequence of this analysis. Uh, in aviation, as distinct from, say, nuclear power, safety is an evolutionary process that depends upon investi investigations. We learn about safety in aviation from investigators, from the investigating reports. That's been largely our main medium of learning. In the nuclear power industry, however, you actually base your estimates of safety and your, you manage your risks on the basis of some future estimate. You negotiate with society and say, OK, we'll accept a 10 to the minus 6 probability for the emission of, of uh, noxious nuclear stuff. And then we will do our probabilistic risk analysis, our fault trees, our vent trees, so that we can put in enough defenses to adjust that. Uh, it's a different way of doing business. But I think it's, uh, it's crucial to, rec to recognize that a lot of what we know depends very largely upon those on the, the bottom triangle. Latent condition pathways in themselves are sufficient. You don't need always to have unsafe acts. You know, Challenger, the uh, I mean, most dramatically, I suppose, is the King's Cross Underground fire in London in the late 80s, uh, when there were no unsafe acts. I mean, they put in this inflammable escalator in 1938. They recognized that, they, that there was an error here. It was, it, was, it was a fire hazard, so they put in sprinklers. And then they kind of neglected those because the Luftwaffe came along, and then there was the sort of dismal 40s, the 50s, and ultimately, Mrs. Thatcher came along, who was more dangerous than the Luftwaffe. And <laughs> what she did 
was to put in a lean and mean management system, you know, outsourcing, retro and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and of course, one of the things that happened was that that particular escalator fell through the cracks in the organogram in the same way as the cigarette end or match fell through the cracks and lit up this bonfire that had been building for 60 odd years beneath and nobody had ever actually uh, gone to look. And so this was almost exclusively to do with the system, systemic errors. So just to reiterate, just an image, along come the mosquitoes, zzz, they bite you, you swat them, but they keep coming. The only way to treat them is to try and address the swamps in which they breed, you know, in, in the swamps are things like all the generic processes, procedures, design, training, the goals you have, uh, the defenses, the planning and so on. There are a number of generic organizational processes out of which these holes stem. I think what happens with latent conditions is that you can't really identify the specifics, but you can identify the processes, the generic vital signs of an organization that are going to inevitably give rise to them one way or another. And you can then make regular checks upon their health state. Just going to the task of managing a business, any business and especially in your businesses, there are two demands that managers must face. They have to deal with production, obviously, and they have to deal with protection. But they don't make equal demands. And there are usually these pressing in your face operational problems that are going to be all the time, you know. And this is what you're trained to do. This is what you're paid to do, uh, to deal with the, with the bottom line, to deal with the operational crises and so on. And safety doesn't have the same degree of urgency except after a bad event. But you can't rely on these catastrophes to perpetually sharpen people's minds. They are the thing that sharpens them most, as we know, from all legislation has gone procedure writing. Procedure writing often is simply a question of adding another procedure to proscribe some act that was implicated in some past event. Don't do that. You know, that's, that's not allowed. But of course, that misunderstands that that act was not in itself sufficient to cause the accident. It was a part of a whole complex of factors which combined in that particular time and so basically what happens is that procedures, laws, legislation make the world more and more constricted until they, they don't allow you enough space to do the job. So if you look at the information that relates to safety and also to commercial pressure and so on, it's quite different. The safety information is delayed, comes you know, after the event, uh, it's intermittent, it's ambiguous, it's unreliable. People lie to you. And what's worse, probably, or I guess it's not so bad, is that any time you have a safety program, it, the, if you the, take a measure of negative outcomes, like lost time injuries, fatalities, whatever, hull losses, that takes that form. There's a rapid decline at the outset, and then there's a plateau. And aviation, as you know, has been on that plateau now, 10 to the 6th, for 25, 30 years. How do you get down to the next order of magnitude? Well, Patrick will argue, and I think he's entirely right, that you need two things. You need safety management systems, and you need to, through that process, create a safer, a safety culture. And there's another thing, too. One has to look at the fact that production and protection, they define a space in which you must operate. If you have along the uh, Along the x-axis, increasing numbers of productive units. You buy more aircraft, and along the y-axis, you need to add commensurate levels of protection, depending upon the nature of production. So, If either of those directions or either of those axes are pursued without the other, you end up in deep trouble. So if you keep on increasing your productive units without commensurate protection, you're likely to end up with a catastrophe. Conversely, if you simply buy the best protection in town and keep on buying protection without production, you go broke. So there has to be some kind of happy medium. And different organizations occupy different parts of that. So high hazard ventures like chemical process, like, new, like uh, aviation, nuclear power, have a, a fair amount of protection per unit of production. Others don't need so much. Large organizations, by and large, 
can afford more protection per unit, per unit productive unit, uh, but small organizations can't. But that isn't altogether a bad thing, because one has to recognize that defenses, protection, uh, layer upon layer of protection, which can be engineered safety features, they can be physical containments, they can be people, pilots are both a protective and a productive unit, they can be uh, main maintenance, although I have my doubts about that, they, they, they can be uh, largely paper, enormous amounts of paper, procedures, permit to work systems, shift handover systems, all the systems that knock around. Uh, one of the problems with defenses, one of the basic problems with defenses, is that they're great. They really do their job. You know, the, if you, the, more line, the, more, the more slices of Swiss cheese you have, the less likely is that there'll be a con collinearity, a trajectory created through the cheese to allow Sod Murphy to put the knitting needle through. But it also makes the system more opaque. So if you're, if you're I was going to say flying a nuclear power plant, but in a way they do, uh, if you're, ha if you're controlling a nuclear power plant, you might as well be boiling fish for all you know about the immediate hazards. There you are in the squeaky clean control room, all, the, all these kinds of layers of computery between you and the process. All you do is to sort of change the set points. You're not actually flying the system. And it has, it has dangers. Almost every defense, I guess, has a double edge. So let me make this point. that. Safety management is never easy. There's no way in which we will ever understand all the ways in which things can hurt us, as is evident. And there's no way we can write procedures that will guarantee, if followed to the letter, that people will not be harmed or hurt. There's not enough trees in the rainforest to allow that to, to, for us, for, for that to happen. So if you think of, you know, writing a recipe, you can write a recipe for cooking that somebody who's not a great cook can follow, maybe in a couple of pages, if you want to do detail by detail. But there's no way you could write a prescription or a procedure that will prevent that person being burnt, cut, or poisoned, or you know, any of those other things. It simply isn't possible. So I think we have to recognize that the business is not easy, and the essence of it is unease. And that's really, I think Patrick will make this point very elegantly, that's not what quality assurance is about. Quality assurance is not about unease. Uh, it's almost about, it's a stroke, it's almost something else. And here's the question that small organizations will ask, can we afford it? We do, we, you know, we're, we're really pretty close to the bone now, can we manage? Well, I don't think that this is necessarily resource limited. Of course, at the outset, there will be extra loading on critical people. Uh, I'm not saying that 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 isn't going to happen. But it's not necessarily a question of money. What it is is a question of a mindset. It's more about mindset than about finance. Management, safety management, is way down at the process end. And in a way, it's the striving to achieve this that is the crucial thing, the attitude of mind. And so I think smaller companies have really advantages in this. They are able to speak to each other. And crucially, they can tell each other war stories. War stories are marvelous media for you know, stories about bad events, things that have happened. Because a story, unlike a collection of numbers in a, in a table, for example, contains the interactions, the complexities that are actually the real thing, the concatenations of events. Whereas numbers can actually be very spurious. And the system, which is small, tends to be more open, more transparent, more flexible, and more adaptable. And of course, it can change more quickly. It can learn fast and change more quickly. So there are many, many advantages. Well, errors are unintended, uh, almost exclusively. Violations uh, are intended, but only one component. Usually, the people intend the act, but not any bad consequence. Normal violators simply intend to deviate for a good reason at the time, not necessarily a malevolent reason, often not a malevolent reason. Errors are cognitive things. They're information processing problems, whereas violations are things to do with the heart rather than the head, often. They're things to do with attitudes, beliefs, with social things, group factors, uh, the, the organizational culture, the situation. You know, if you think about, I can't do it in kilometers, but if you think about driving at 120 miles an hour, most of your cars and most of your roads would permit that. And 
you know, you're, you're good drivers, but you, you're unfamiliar with the regime of the, of the vehicle at that speed. You don't know its handling characteristics and so on, or its steering characteristics. You're more likely to make an error, and as a consequence, because you're near the edge, uh, you're likely to have a bad outcome. So this is one thing I wanted to stress, that the violation is not enough. It's the error you make while violating that kills you or kills people. Briefly looking at violation types, Routine violations. We operate by the principle of least effort. We cut corners. It's a very sound, adaptive principle. Uh, we think it's laziness. It's not. We do it all the time. Uh, so if you contrive a set of procedures that are re requiring a kind of cack-handed way of going from one step to the next, then people on the hoof will make the shortcut. Often there are improvements over the procedures. One should not assume that procedures are right, actually, in the nuclear industry. Most of the problems that arrive in human performance are from lousy procedures. Then there are optimizing There's things you do for kicks, you know, uh, to get a buzz. So it's something we all have lots of, uh, we have a big agenda. We're not just getting the job done. We're driving because we want to get a buzz for speed. We want to beat up other cars. And also we want to get from A to B. Um, and of course, the last one is the main category, w which I think is the one that really needs managing because that's the thing that falls into your gift is people violate simply to get the job done they haven't got the tools they haven't got the they haven't got the time they haven't got the adequate procedures to follow to get the job done as it should be done so they do it their way and uh, these are quite important i think i want to make the point that if you look at clusters of factors that provoke errors i'm uh, sorry violations then the personal ones are important yes but they're only one of these three there's a whole bunch of stuff uh, which comes from things that are within your control. And violation management, I think, is a question not so much of getting people to fear the consequences of violation, although that has obviously an impact when you're driving. Uh, visibility of, of enforcement agencies on the road is a very good thing for keeping uh, speed down. But the, the other alternative is to make compliance the attractive option. That means having elegant solutions that do not require long and laborious you know, excursions to get the job done or do not seem to be stupid, uh, and, and, and which invite people to do what they would naturally do to take the path which is both safe, productive, and has least effort. The key to an effective culture is a just culture so that you negotiate as a group, management and the workforce, where you draw the line between that which is acceptable and that which is unacceptable. There are acts, bad acts, done by you know, egregious errors, egregious violations, done by reckless cowboys. Everyone in the organization knows who they are, and if they are not in some way sanctioned visibly, then the, the whole system loses credibility. So a no-blame culture is, is obviously nonsense. Uh, I know it's been a fashion for the last 15 years, but it's absolute nonsense. Uh, so one needs a just culture which defines the 10% or so of unacceptable actions within the scope of the workforce, and then says the remaining 90 or 95% are, can be reported blame without blame. And the key is that a, the safe culture is an informed culture. It knows where the edge is without having to fall over it only knows where the edge is, not because of the outcome data, you have so few bad events, but because people tell you when they've come up against the edge. They tell you their war stories, they tell you about their free lessons, their near misses, their incidents, and they won't tell you unless they trust you, and they won't trust you unless there is a clear, just culture, which is the key. And you have to recognize that most of the things that are actually uh, influencing violating behavior are in your hands rather than in the heads, the malevolent heads of the workforce. You have the, your, your business is to manage the situation, to manage the task. And although it's very tempting to hound, if you like, what you think are the bad, the bad things that are going on in the heads of the workforce, it's much more effective to have a safety management system that manages violation provoking factors or to have a system that manages error-provoking factors. Those are the things that you manage. And there, and there are engineering solutions to these human and social problems. They, you don't need a shrink you know, to come and sort of divine what's going on in people's heads. Uh, you just need to be able to 
manage your own system. And the crucial point about all of this management stuff, safety management or whatever, is that it's an integral part of the process of business, of the business process of, of managing your system. It's not an add-on. When we're looking at a just culture, it's very tempting to say, errors are OK, nobody intended those, so we won't punish the error makers. But violations, there is an intentional component, therefore we will. And that isn't as simple as you might think. And I want to demonstrate this with an avi aviation maintenance example uh, with three scenarios. Here is the situation. An aircraft engineer is required to check the rivets of the aircraft, the shell of the aircraft, on the, on the ramp for cracks. And the procedures, the company procedures, demand or require that the, there is a special aircraft-related work stand and uh, uh, the appropriate battery of lights uh, is, is taken. Three scenarios. The first scenario is where the aircraft engineer uh, follows the procedures to the letter, goes to the stores, draws the stand and the lights, checks the rivets in the approved, in the approved fashion, but being human, he misses the crack or she misses the crack. Then there's the cowboy. The cowboy says, stuff that. I'm not going to do that sort of stuff. Just gets out his flashlight and sort of skids underneath, uh, waving his flashlight up six feet above him, and misses the crack as a consequence of that behavior. Clearly reckless behavior. And then there's the third person who goes, this is reality. This is, the reali this is aviation maintenance as I know it. You go to the stores, the work stand is out, broken, or not even existent, and, and the lights are missing in some way. So what does the guy do? He tries to do his best. He does what B does, but for quite a different motive. He, he goes under the aircraft with, with a flashlight and misses the crack. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that the error in all three scenarios is the same, the missed crack, uh, a threat to airworthiness. But scenario B and scenario C both involve violations of procedures, people, department. But it's quite clear that the culpability is quite different between B and C. Almost everybody, we tried this on and we do it in different, different scenarios, different contexts, would say that A and C are blameless. And B is the man who's, uh, for whom the gibbet uh, should be brought back. Uh, so, I mean, for whom zero, Patrick has a rich imagination, he'll talk about heads on pikes. But I mean, basically, you want to make a visible example of this individual. The severity of the, if you like, the sanction for these reckless people is something that will foster the, the culture that will actually encourage people to trust you and to talk to you and to tell you about their errors. So let me just sum up and say that what I've tried to say is that there are differences between quality management and safety management. There is a big overlap. Safety management is very much a question of a state of mind. There are many, many ways of achieving it, but essentially the common process is having that mindset where it's uneasiness, it's wariness. The good cultures, the, the, the safe cultures, the high reliability organizations, uh, manage to take this burden of anxiety, fear, away from the individual, so preserving their stomach linings, and as it were, embeds it in the culture and the culture is one of reminding people to be afraid, rather than they have to go around being afraid all the time. But the key thing is that it's not necessarily resource dependent. If you have the will and you have the mindset, then it will be successful. Thank you very much. There are several